Good evening. It is March the 3rd, 2021, and it is time for our midweek Bible study here at Travis Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. We're glad you've joined us, and just to kind of let you know on what's going on, the big news, of course. Yesterday, the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, uh, put out the declaration that the state mandate for masks is over as of a week from today. Um in that businesses can go back to resuming 100% capacity if they so choose. What it basically means is it's kind of up to individual businesses like HEB. Do they still want their customers to wear a mask or not? Um, and uh, as opposed to someone else making them. So what we're going to do here at church is we are asking, we're recommending masks. Uh, we definitely want you to have one on when we're like in the foyer mingling and during the visitor welcome time. But when in your, you're in your pew, you're in your class, and you're spread out, um, if you want to take it off, take it off. Um, I'm not going to get on you for that. So um, we still want to be careful when we're around others. We do have a lot of members that are vulnerable. Um, we have a lot that have started getting their vaccines in working. Some of them have had two. Some are still just on their first shot. But praise the Lord, uh, progress is being made. So that's kind of how we're going to handle it here. Um, also want to remind you, we are coming up close to the Easter season. And this year... Uh, we're just going to have Easter whether the county likes it or not. I'll tell you what. Um, Easter is going to be April 4th, the first Sunday in, in April. Um, we are going to have on Good Friday our annual, except for last year, our annual Good Friday movie. I think we're going to watch War Room. It's a book about uh, uh, prayer. Uh, not a book, it's a movie uh, about prayer. Very motivating thing. And then... Um, uh, on Sunday, of course, we will have our special time of worship. We will have, hopefully, some extra music. We're asking some people to get some special music ready for that day. We're also going to have our egg hunt after church. And then I think we're going to try on Saturday, between Good Friday and Easter morning, having the annual egg hunt over at the Marbella Apartments for the kids over there, if they allow it. So, um... Probably the last Saturday in March, the 27th of March, I believe it is, we are going to go through our neighborhood with some information to hang on people's doors, inviting them to our Easter activities. We want you to be part of that, all right? So get fired up. God is doing things. We're still here. God is still working. And let's seek his face in all of this, all right? Let's pray. Father, we love you and we praise your holy name. We are so glad you're doing the great things you're doing. We hope that very soon, Father, uh, there will be absolute healing from this virus. We hope very soon, Lord, there will be a, a pouring out of your Spirit upon this church, upon this country, upon this world, that many are saved, a revival happening, hearts turning to you. God, we want to see your work in, a, 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 visible among us. We want to see you doing great and mighty things so all people will praise your holy name. We pray for our caregivers, our first responders. We pray for those who are struggling so much right now. We are grateful for those you've given good news to. And we ask you, Lord, bless this time as we open up your word and study it together. We say these things in the name of Christ. Amen. All righty. We have been talking about death, the last enemy, for, oh, since before Christmas. We are kind of now talking about resurrection. And, um... So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians in your New Testament, chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 12 through 19 today. And um, we saw in the first part of 1 Corinthians 15, ver first 11 verses, we talked about how vital the resurrection is. It's part of the gospel. Um, as the gospel is defined in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, that Jesus died according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose in the grave, according to the scriptures. It is important what we believe. We like to say sometimes, I don't care what you believe, I want to see your actions. And that, that's a good thing, but our beliefs drive our actions. So for those of you that are saying, you know, I want to see your faith by your works, um, if we've got faith, we're going to do and we're going to obey. And so yes, I understand, yeah, we need to see our faith in action. But that faith also needs to be based on the right things. Um, believing. 
that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose from the grave on the third day is vital. Yes, it's doctrine. It's theology. And some people say, I don't like doctrine and theology. I just want the Bible. Well, the teachings of the Bible are called doctrine and the teachings about God are called theology. So, quit your griping. Um, we come to reading 1 Corinthians 15 and we see a great exposition on the idea of resurrection. In these first... 11 verses, as we saw in last week's message, which you can search through on Facebook, our YouTube page, and on our website at travisbaptist.org. Um, we talked about the reality of that resurrection, that there were witnesses, that it really did happen. It's not just something we believe. We believe it because it happened, because it's true. Jesus died on the cross, just like the Old Testament said he would. He was buried and he rose in the grave, just like the Old Testament said he would. Because He did that, He is our Savior. He is the one who gives us eternal life. <coughs> because we believe His message, believe it enough to build our life on it. And this is kind of what He hits at today. We're going to talk about the resurrection is important for us to believe. Because if we take it out, oh, it makes a difference. See, a version of Christianity that's kind of popular is... Christianity is all about loving your neighbor like yourself. Okay, that's the second greatest commandment. I'm good with it. But we are only able to love our neighbor as ourselves because of the love of Christ that's come into us. The motivation for loving our neighbor as ourself is ultimately that we give an account of this life to God. That means we're going to be resurrected and judged. Okay? We're going to talk about judgment later, especially for Christians. That's going to be on down the line, so keep up with this series. But uh, suffice it to say that our hope and our belief in the resurrection drives pretty near everything we do. Um, you and I may think we've got pure motivations, but ultimately... The fact that Jesus rose from the grave, first off, you know, it proves his message was true. It proves that he was who he said he was, that he was God the Son, deity clothed in flesh, born of the Virgin, but nonetheless existed since eternity past. Jesus was there at creation last summer. You can go back on our website, on our YouTube page, maybe you search enough on this Facebook page. And you will find our series on Colossians. The sermons on Colossians chapter 1 took me like, like 10 sermons on 18 verses because uh, there is so much there about who Jesus is. And if He is who He says He is, that makes Him very, very special. Not just a gifted man or a teacher, but in fact, God among us. God with us. Emmanuel. And... When we look at the fact that God came to earth, took on human flesh, became 100% human, 100% God, at the same time, the only one who could possibly pay the punishment for our sin, and then rising from the grave, shows the validity of His message and what we believe in. And here in verses 12 through 19, the Word of God is going to talk to us about, you know, if we take the resurrection out... We got nothing. You're going to hear me say this a lot today. We're going to have nothing if we take out the resurrection of Jesus and if we take out or if we take out the resurrection of his believers. It is a major driving force in why we're Christians. Thomas Jefferson, um, for whatever reason, decided at some point in time, back in the early days of America, that because he was such a good rationalist, he was going to take out all the miraculous stuff of the Bible so that we were only left with its moral and historical teachings. Um, bad idea. You, like we like to say, he took out all the good stuff. Um, to say it's all fantasy, to say it's all a fairy tale basically yanks the very foundation of Christianity out from under it. That is why in the first part of the chapter, he spends his time saying, look, Jesus rose from the grave, all right? He was seen by the disciples. He was seen by the twelve. He was seen by James and John. He was seen by 500 people at one point in time. And then he was seen by me, the Apostle Paul, on my way to Damascus. Jesus rose from the grave. It's not a fairy tale. 
You can call it that if you want to. And that's why I think the devil puts in people's hearts to attack the resurrection. It's impossible it could have happened that way. Well, yeah, it does yank it out. Yanks the rug out from under us. That's what verses 12 to 19 are all about. So let's get into this. If I decide, okay, I like the love your neighbor parts. I like the do unto others. I like the, the you know, um, the happy things. But this whole thing about his death and his resurrection, not so much. What happens if we leave that part of the story out? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. That's verses 12 and 13. If, if we yank out the resurrection, and we're going to have like six reasons here today why that's a bad thing for us. If the resurrection is not true, look what he says. If Christ is preached in verse 12, if it's been proclaimed that Christ has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? In other words, it is central to our message that Jesus died and rose in the grave. Now, if you're saying the rest of us are not going to, why would you say that? Because his whole purpose of rising was to show us that we also shall rise. Now, verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Here's the logic. Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. He's the first one. Then the rest of us will follow. We will get into the more of that in this chapter later on. But let's say his argument number one, if we take the resurrection out, and argument number one is that we are just left with a dead Messiah. If Christ rose from the grave, how do you say that the rest of us won't? That's part of the whole purpose of it. Is that as he rises, so we shall also. And if Christ is not risen, verse 4, 13, if there is no resurrection, if I'm not going to rise and you're not going to rise from the dead, if there's no hope for us in eternity, then Christ is not risen either. You can't have one without the other. So our first problem is if you don't believe the resurrection and you don't want it to be part of your gospel message, you don't want to be something you believe in, you've got a dead Messiah on your hands. There's a poll taken every few years of Christians about what they believe. I think it's done every couple, three years. And recently, like 2018 or so, 42%, pretty near half, of God's, God's people, Christians, Christians, say that Christianity is not exclusive. In other words, there are other ways to God. There is Islam, there is Hindu, there is Mao, there is whatever it is you want to make up, paganism, Wicca, everything else. Um, if those are equally valid ways to God, then Jesus Christ's death was worse than a tragedy. It was flat out murder. And because, because he died to bring us to him. Um, this Sunday, we're continuing our series on torn uh, through the torn veil to the empty tomb. And, and we're going to talk about how if Christ, he gave his life for us. And if we don't believe that that is the only way, then he subjected himself to a brutal murder for no reason. We are saying to him, your death is really basically meaningless. If Mahatma Gandhi can get us there, if Confucius can get us there, if whatever it is I make up on a Saturday night can get us there, if paganism, if wickedism, if, if any of these isms out there, outside of Christ can get us there, then Jesus, that was a whole waste of time. If Christ is not risen, and that's really the whole crux of Christianity, that Jesus from the if Christ is not risen and we're not going to rise, then we got a dead Messiah. I don't want to worship a dead man. The object of my faith is alive. As we saw in the earlier verses, 500 people saw Jesus alive after his crucifixion. He did not just pass out and get better. Remember, when you were crucified, he not only had the nails driven through his hands and he was whipped. At the end of it all, they took a spear and ran that spear up into his rib cage, so that as his blood came out, the blood had separated from plasma. That's why it says the, 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 his blood and water separated. 
Running a spear up through your side, you're bound to hit a lung, a kidney, a liver lobe. You're bound to hit maybe even the heart. They ran that thing up. These soldiers that were guarding him at the cross were guys who knew what a dead body looked like. As Jerry Clower was said, when they took Jesus down off that cross, he was graveyard dead. He wasn't just comatose and got better. There wouldn't have been any way for him to get better because man must have lost nine pints of blood just from that spear wound. Something that big, being untreated. Lay in that grave three days, no medical care. You don't think infection or strep would set in? Jesus was dead. And yet, three days later, he is seen. And for a month, he is seen. And the world is turned upside down because people saw the living Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ. But if he's not resurrected, then I'm not resurrected, and I got a dead Messiah. Yeah, this, this, I believe that because a dead Messiah gives us nothing. Our second reason for believing the resurrection and this is, like I said, going beside just the evidence. The first reason is if there's no resurrection, then, then we've just got a dead Messiah and there's nothing to follow. Second reason. Um, if Christ didn't rise from the grave, our message and our faith are empty. Verse 14. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching, our proclamation, our teaching is empty and your faith is also empty. If Jesus did not rise from the grave, I got nothing. I've got nothing to say to you. I've got nothing to base my hope on. I am as bad as the guys who worship a head of lettuce. I have nothing to stand on. You know, we sing songs in church, the old songs anyway. My faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand, and all other ground is seeking sand. If I got nothing to stand on, if he didn't rise from the grave, then the message is gone. It's just happy thoughts about loving one another and doing right. Um, and then we got to throw out, like Thomas Jefferson, all that stuff like, I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. All that becomes meaningless. John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, pfft, doesn't mean a thing if Jesus did not rise from the grave. Number one, we believe if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, we got a dead Messiah. Number two, if Jesus didn't rise, our message and our faith are empty. Number three, we are misleading everybody. Verse 15, yes. If Christ didn't rise, yes. We are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. So if there is no resurrection of believers, if there is no resurrection of Jesus, well, you know what? We told you there was. It makes us liars. You may think every preacher out there and every pastor and every religious person is a shyster, and I'm sorry you feel that way. But if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, you know what? We really are. We are, we are less than lying. We are less than con men. If our message is empty... We have said, I mean, I have said, I have stood before people and said, man, a night in January of 1979, I read that passage where Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And in that moment, something I did not believe before, I believed then. I wanted Jesus. That's how I know he's risen. My spirit bearing witness with his spirit that he is, and we are children of God. The fact is, that we're lying to you if there's no resurrection. Because what he says in verse 15, we testified that God raised him up. But if there's no resurrection, then God didn't. Reason number four. Reason number one was, we, if Jesus didn't rise, then we're just wor worshiping a dead Messiah. And reason number two, if Jesus, di Jesus didn't rise from the grave, our message and our faith are empty. Reason number three, we are misleading everyone if Jesus didn't rise from the grave. And reason number four, 
is we are all hopeless. We are lost. Verse 16. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. The whole reason Christ came to earth wasn't just to teach us to be better people. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Our sin, just as Adam got kicked out of the garden because of his sin, our sin separates us from God, and we remained separated. Jesus came that in dying upon that cross, the wrath of God could be satisfied. That the punishment for sin and its condemnation had been suffered by someone, and then he rises from the grave, and we are no longer separated. Now all of that has been removed, and we draw near to God. We are doing the series, Torn, on Sunday mornings. This is a theme that just as, as Christ died, the tim veil in the temple that separated the most holiest place, the actual presence of God from everybody, you couldn't go in there, that veil tore from top to bottom miraculously. The point there being that, yes, now we can all come close. We're no longer separated. We no longer have to stand back. So many pictures, come join us Sunday. Um, so many pictures in the Bible about how we are away from God. But now, because of this and the resurrection, because He rose, now all of that between us and God is removed and we can come close. Let us draw near with full assurance. You think God doesn't want you? Everything that happened on that cross and that empty tomb was to bring you in close. But if Christ is not risen, none of that's true. We're back being separated. We are lost. We are hopeless. We got nothing. Our hope is built on nothing less. Nope, our hope is built on nothing if Jesus did not rise. Verse 17, if Christ is not risen, our faith is futile, misdirected, useless. And we are still separated from God in our sins, standing condemned. If Christ didn't rise from the grave, we got a dead Messiah. If Christ didn't rise from the grave, our faith is empty. Our message is empty. We are misleading everybody. If Christ did not rise from the grave, we are all still lost. And number five, if Christ didn't rise from the grave, then the grave is all we got waiting for us. Verse 18. Then also, if Christ didn't rise from the grave, then also... Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. You know how we talk about in heaven, we'll get to see grandma and grandpa, and maybe that child you lost along the way, your best friend, people you love, your dog that meant so much to you, that cat that actually liked you. We'll get to see them all in heaven, we like to tell ourselves. If there's a resurrection, yes. If Christ rose from the grave, yes. But if he didn't, and if there's no resurrection, Guess what? Verse 18. Then everyone who's fallen asleep, everyone who's died, they perished also. That means the grave is it. Now, perish can mean in one sense they've been condemned to hell. Or it just means it all stops. I don't like either one of those prospects. I mean, think about it. You get up every day. Why do you go to work? So I can make money. Why do you need to make money? So I can pay my bills, keep the lights on, keep the roof on, feed my family. So you go to work. And then you feed them. And then you go to work. And then you feed And what's left at the end? You die. You know, there's a meme out there on the internet, you know, about how, um, uh, you know, you give your life to your job. But guess what? When you fall down, they scoop you up, toss you out, and get someone else to do your job. And life goes on for them, but it doesn't for you. Yes, your boss, your place of work, this church, they'll replace us. Life is more than just going to work. Life, isn't it more than just keeping your head above water? If at the end of your life, all you've got is a good credit rating, what's that say about us? What drives us as God's people is that there is an eternity. 
We do give an account for God. I give 10% of my income to our church. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying. It's a part of my obedience to God. In fact, sometimes it's even more than that. Do you realize, you know, I'd pretty much be debt free if I didn't do that. But you know what? I invest in God's kingdom with eternal rewards. As Jesus said, because there's a resurrection, I lay up for myself treasures in heaven. That when I get there, I will see that what we sacrificed as a family blessed so many other people. It may not be much, but it's enough that when pulled with the rest of God's resources and multiplied by His mighty hand like He did with the loaves and the fishes where He fed 10,000 with like a dozen fish, He blesses the whole world through what we give. The grave's not the end for me because Jesus rose from the grave. Therefore, I live my life with, in light of the fact that this part here is temporary and my resources, I invest in God's kingdom. It makes a difference to how I live. But if there is no resurrection and the grave is all there is, boy, am I wasting time and money. That when you die, you're just worm dirt. That those people you loved and that dog that was always so glad to see you, no, you're never going to see him again. It's over. At best, there's annihilation. At worst, there's condemnation and an eternal hell if there's no resurrection. Because really, those people in hell, they were resurrected also. So I guess annihilation. And, and it, does that really... Then, then this life here becomes just, well, let me grab all the gusto I can. Let me do whatever. Why should I do what is right? Why should I not just do whatever? Do what's right in my eyes. Somebody hurts me, I kill them. Get them out of the way. Why not? So I can have what they had. So I don't have to be... Even, you see, without a resurrection, we got no basis for even being moral. If the grave is all there is. We have built ourselves on the here and now. But if you ever stop and think and realize that's all that there is is here and now. Man, how depressing would that make it? Those who have fallen asleep in Christ also perish. But if the resurrection is real, ooh, it's so different. And our sixth reason, our final reason, of why it's a bad thing if Christ is not risen. Number one, worshiping a dead Messiah, man, that is useless. Number two, our message and faith being empty. Yeah, that's if Jesus is not risen, if there's no resurrection, a dead Messiah, an empty faith, and we are liars with our message. And not only that, number four, we are all still lost. There's no hope for us. Number five, the grave is all that awaits us. Worm dirt, nothingness. And finally, if there is no resurrection, we have lost everything. Look at he says in verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ. If Jesus is just for this life, we are of all people most pitiable. Wow. See, we like to say, I would believe in Jesus even if there were no heaven. I should love him enough that, yeah, I'm not doing it for the reward. But when I find out about the reward, it sure does motivate me. I'm ready to lose myself for his sake. Ready to give up those things, those freedoms, those rights for his sake. Because I know I've got something bigger and better. But if there is no bigger and better... Man, have I wasted my time. The Apostle Paul, who has seen the third heaven, he says, according to 2 Corinthians, says, man, if that's not for real, my life's been a waste of time. I am the most pitiable. You should just feel sorry for me. Some people feel sorry for us anyway because, you know what, I'm not out there partying. I'm not out there just living my life without moral restraint. I am not doing a lot of things because I'm going to stand before my God one day. And I also know my God has better for me than anything this world offers. How do I know that? Because Christ rose from the grave. But if, he, but if he didn't, knocks the bottom out of everything. You see, that's what this little lesson here is about. Is he's saying to him, look, in the first 11 verses, 
The resurrection is vital to the gospel. And it proves the gospel because we all saw him resurrected. Now, if you're going to say there's no resurrection, look, you just knocked the foundation out from everything. What do you all believe then? If you're not believing the resurrection, you've got nothing. All the rest of it doesn't matter. We're going to go on next week. That because Christ is risen, what great difference that makes. We've been a bit negative today to tell you that, you know what, this whole Christian thing hinges on the resurrection. So it is important what you believe. It is important that you believe Christ rose from the grave on the third day. For if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's part of the gospel. To not believe it yanks the gospel out. It's no longer the gospel. I encourage you, if you've never put your trust in Christ, now do it. He died on that cross, suffering so we wouldn't have to. A condemnation that we deserve. But he didn't stay in that grave. Oh, he was definitely dead. When they crucified him, they had the nails in his hands and his feet. They had whipped him. They had done all this stuff. And then to finish it all off, these experienced soldiers who had been in battlefields and knew what a dead man looked like, ran a spear up through the side of Jesus. It is approximately 30 A.D. There is no antibiotics. There's very little surgical method. Generally, having a spear ran into your torso pretty much meant for death. Because undoubtedly, they must have clipped a kidney, a liver lobe. They must have gotten part of your stomach, a lung, maybe even pierced the heart. You were not going to survive that. When they pierced him with that spear, they didn't just stick it in a little way. They ran it up in there and they yanked it back out, tearing more organs and flesh on the way. It says in the Bible that his blood and the water had separated. Basically, that means the red blood cells and the, the plasma had separated because the blood wasn't circulating anymore. The heart wasn't pumping. As Jerry Clower says, he was graveyard dead. But three days later, they go to check on that tomb Sunday morning and that stone is rolled away. Experienced battle-hardened soldiers fled in terror when he came out of that grave. And then he was seen by Peter, by John, by, by the twelve, by over 500 people at one time. Jesus rose from the grave. Believe that. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's for you right now. Pray with me. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for the resurrection and the message of your Son. Jesus, we praise you that you did not hesitate to give your life for ours. You died on that cross to take all the anger, all the punishment, all the, the debt that we owed. You died the death we deserved. You suffered the condemnation that is our deserved end. But then you rose from the grave to give victory over it all. To show us that death would not hold you. That resurrection was coming not just for you but for all of us. That eternal life can be ours for all who believe. Right now maybe someone wants to believe Lord. That right now they would be praying to you Lord help me to believe. I, I believe Jesus you died for my sins. You rose from the grave. I just don't know where to go from here. Lord we're praying for that person that you'll give them guidance. That maybe they can contact our church and we can help them move forward in their faith. We pray for these things, Lord. We pray for these who've listened today. Praying, God, that they'll grow closer to you. In all these things we say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be having live service this Sunday, March the 4th. Or the 7th, rather. March the 7th. Um, we will have Sunday school at 9.30, Bible study at 9.30. We will have worship at 10.45. Travis Baptist Church, Weber Road, and across the street from the HEB on Weber here in Corpus Christi. Come and join us, and we hope to see you Sunday.